They told him what happened. So he says, all right, he says, we got to get rid of him. I'm looking at him. I said, you got to get rid of who? He says, we got to get rid of the Pope. Are you fucking kidding me? Says, no. He said, you're coming with us. I'm coming with you. Yeah, you're coming with us. So my grandfather says, I'll come. Says, Let's talk. What happened? So my, my grandfather says, I give you the okay. I give you my blessing. Because they came in to get my grandfather's okay. To take, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. To take this guy out. Now, I have to go with him for two reasons. One is to tell them how to uh, put him away nicely without using violence. So he says, I said, what me? He goes, well, you were in Nam. I said, yeah, but in Nam, I killed him with guns and stuff. He goes, no, but okay, I got to tell you how to do it very peacefully. Okay. And second, here's where you're going to get the laugh. I got to be their witness before God. I looked at him. I said, what? He says, when we die... So we're going to go before God, and God's going to say, you killed one of my popes. And we can say, no, we did it humanely. He didn't suffer. He didn't have any pain. And God's going to say to them, well, who's your witness? They're going to say, our cousin Anthony's our witness. So I'm supposed to go before God, tell them this. God, as I said, is going to look at me, and he's going to go, uh-uh, he's going to pull the lever. I'm going to go to hell. The devil's going to say, no, nah, I don't want you to eat. He's going to pull that, and I don't know where the fuck I'm going to wind up. I said, you got to kill a pope? He says, yeah. I said, you're crazy. He says, you know how many years we've been killing popes in this in, in the Vatican, how many centuries we've been doing it? For centuries. If they didn't like the guy that was in, they got rid of him and put their own guy in. Oh, wow. I go back with him, and I'm saying, you got you, you guys are fucked. No. I saw the whole route of the pope. I says, here's what you do. You either get ketamine or Valium, put it in his tea, because he likes his tea real sweet. This mm -hmm. is once he goes to sleep, you get potassium cyanide in a glass bottle. Well, why not plastic? I said, well, if you get plastic, when it eats through it, I said, we're all going to be dead. You get glass with a glass eyedropper. Fill the eyedropper up, put it in between his lips, just squeeze, and he walk out of the room. Pope turns around, falls asleep. We're watching everything. All the cardinals, everybody's there. Goes in, boop, puts it in, walks out, closes the door. The guy who brings the tea and everything goes to check on the Pope. Half hour later, ringing the bell. There's something wrong with the Pope. Something wrong with the Pope. Doctor comes in. Pope is dead. Now they're crying. You hypocritical bastard. You just whacked the guy and you're crying. <coughs> My cousin goes, we've got to make it look good. Now, here's the catch. The only one who can touch a Pope, you got to be a doctor, embalmer, or whatever. You have to be with the Vatican, living in Vatican City. You can't be like a cardinal and you're a doctor and you live outside in Rome. You got to be living in Vatican City, otherwise you can't touch it. In other words, everything is in-house. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew what was going to go on. They laid him out. After that, right in the wall. Goodbye. That's oh, right, because they put him in the... Uh, yeah, in the wall, in the mausoleum. Yeah, yeah mausoleum. Yeah. But there's a lot more to that story, but I got that in book too, which you'll all be surprised on, on seeing, find out who he was related to this guy. The, with that Pope, Pope? Pope? I'm very oh, yeah. curious. I'm very uh, curious. That, that's got it. That's in book two. All right. But I'll tell you one thing. One thing I will tell you. It was always written in stone that when the Pope died, he would get in and he got in like that. It was already written in stone that he would become the next Pope. Oh, interesting. So that isn't some sort of like deliberative process. That's That was already decided beforehand. Because of who he was related to. And like I said, it's in book two, but... When book two comes out, I'll, if you want an interview on it, I'll give you an interview uh, on that, and I'll let you know. You bet, You'll of be course. very surprised. You'll be in shock when you see that. I am... Uh, and especially it, about Lufthansa. I even got more about Lufthansa in book two, not everything that was in book one. I definitely want to hear about that, too. Yeah. yeah. I w but, but now, for the things that you can talk about, I want to talk about how the next pope didn't just get whacked. Like, for, So, first of all, you know, you, you wanted to kill this this pope, or they wanted to no, kill no, this no, pope. No, 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 no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Back up, back up. Uh-huh. I did not want to kill him. Right, right. I, no, I my cousins did, not right. me. No, 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 no. I did not want to kill him. I never said I wanted to kill him. My cousins are the ones who wanted to do it, not me. So, so th this guy, he was to refresh people's memory. He was gonna. He was. He heard about the sock fraud, and he was like, "I got to find out who was behind this. Root out the corruption. Take him out." No, he knew who it was. He, he really knew, who, knew it who it was. Oh, he yeah. already knew. Okay, so he was going to replace too many people, and they said this guy's got to go. Okay. And, and the next pope comes in and says, what? Don't worry about it? Pope John Paul II comes in. We get a call. My cousins are coming in again. 
come in. We gotta go see Grandpa. Said, What's going on? They said Pope John Paul the first, uh, the second, excuse me, said Saturday he's calling a meeting. I said so. He goes, if he's gonna call a meeting about the stock fraud, they told my grandpa says, you know, we're gonna take him. We're gonna get rid of him. I goes, you gonna kill another? I said, are you guys fucking? Said, no, we're gonna get rid of him. So my grandfather goes, he goes, gotta go back. I said, are you kidding me? He goes. Go. When my grandfather says go, you go. Grandson or not, you go. Trust me when I tell you. My grandfather was from the old country and he didn't give a shit about nothing. I said, nah, I said, I said we're going to get, I said, I'm going to hell easily. Or I'm going someplace worse. They're, they're notorious. Nah, don't worry. They tell me, don't. I said, yeah, don't worry about it for you guys. Said, I'm screwed. P.S. <clears throat> I go back to the hotel. Day of the, the day of the meeting comes. My cousin Jacob comes in. You have fun. Yeah, they had, I had girls there. I couldn't. I hadn't. I mean, these girls were like naked walking around. I didn't even have to. I didn't even. I wasn't into. Oh, yeah, I want to have sex. I was just worried about. I got to go there. Why should have killed this other friggin' pope? P.S. He leaves. He comes back a couple hours later, and he hits the door to the room. Up, boom! I saw his face. I said, "Oh shit!" Just the look on his face. I says, "This guy's gonna die." Walks over. He puts his hand on my left. He puts his hand on my shoulder. And he hits me down hard. Oh! I look at him. He goes. I said, you got to be fucking kidding me. He's got to go too. He goes, I said, Jesus Christ. He goes, nah, I was only fooling. Everything's all right. This guy's fine. <laughs> hey, you <laughs> son of a bitch. I'd like to hit you with a bottle in the head. I said, what happened? Pope John Paul II said, anything that transpired before my reign now is forgotten about. I'm only concerned about from today on. This guy got away by the skin of his teeth. If he said he was going to do it, they were prepared to take him out. Do you think maybe he knew that? And so he was like, I don't want to deal Hell with this. Hell yeah, he knew. Of course he knew. He's no dumb. I mean, just because you're a priest in the Vatican, well, it doesn't mean you're a dope. You know what's going on. Especially when the guy gets, the guy cashes his chips in after 33 days. And then when you go by the box, you have that little odor that smells like amaretta. That's the freaking poison. And I'll tell you something. I told the Vatican, I was interviewed from Spain, England, Rome, the, the other paper, the wire and all these things. And they got in touch with the Vatican. The Vatican's answer, you know what their answer was? No comment. Don't come back here no more. And oh, I wow. challenged the Vatican. I says, I challenged the Vatican, get Pope John Paul I, do a tissue test or a bone marrow test or whatever, and you'll see that poison is still in the system to this day. They don't even want to talk to me, the Vatican. Yeah, they don't want to deal with that. Yeah. They don't want to Meanwhile, deal with that. Meanwhile, last, last year, yeah, it was last year in November, after all this came out, my cousin Nancy calls me up. She says, put on the History Channel. They had a thing about Pope John Paul I. They suspect foul play all of a sudden. <laughs> After my book and everything came out. And I got in touch with the Vatican. As a matter of fact, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy from the Post wrote a big article. Oh, but he put it down that I went there to whack the Pope. Uh, what the hell? Brad Hamilton. Mm -hmm. He put out a big article in October of last year. But he put down that I went out there to whack the Pope. I mean, he changed it around. You know what I'm saying? He he changed it around. Like he basically said that I went there with a squad to kill the Pope. No, I didn't go there with no squad to kill the Pope. Then he said we partied after that. He changed the story around quite a bit. But he but everybody got the gist of the idea. Now people look at me like I killed the friggin' Pope. I mean I did. But that was back in October. You mentioned that the people you killed, they broke the rules. What type of rules? You know, not kicking up money to the boss, for example, or what else? No, that's not that's not that's a not, rule. No. That's just a cultural thing? Well, it's not anything. You, you, I mean, you, you're supposed to kick up. You know, if you're greedy or selfish or you're supposed to kick up because it goes in also, like a lot of people told me, I was running the Teamsters under John Gotti. And I said, uh, he, would, he gave me 20%. So to run it. And he got 80%. But it belongs to the family and it belongs to the boss. So the agents asked me, didn't that bother you? No. Why would it bother me? He owns this family and him, not me. So he gets 800,000 out of the million and I got 200,000. You think I should be mad at him? That I was put in position to earn 200,000? Well, it's. It's nothing. 
supposing you were Trump's son-in-law and he put you somewhere and you were making 500,000. He made 10 million, 20 million. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be mad or jealous that he gave you a fucking position that you owed 500,000? Right. If you are jealous or mad, then you're a jerk off. I'm not a jerk off. I, it was a good job. I made 200,000 a year and other powers that it gave me. So, no, I wasn't mad. You know, so it all depends on how you look at things, I guess. What were the rules then that got people killed? You know, you mentioned you're killing people that you love, killing your friends. You know, they broke the rules, so they had to go. What kind of rules are we talking about? You can't about? raise your hands to another friend of ours, another main guy. So no fighting. That's interesting. Okay. You can't raise your hands. The first guy who threw a punch, you can get. The guy could defend himself, and if he can kill you, kill you. And if that don't happen, and they know that you raised your hands first to a friend of ours, then you could be killed for that. Going with somebody's wife or kids is the death penalty. Me and you are in the mafia. You're my brother. Your wife is my sister-in-law. Your kids are my nieces and nephews. Mm -hmm. That's the way we have to look at it. Now, if you violate that in any way, I don't care if your wife is the biggest pig in the world and she's coming off to me. There's no excuse for this. I don't care. You have to be man enough to walk away from that. And as a man, I understand men, we like women. But... There's a limit. So you cross that line. You're supposed to get killed for that. So most of the times you can and you will. But sometimes you might be able to escape it for whatever reason because every, every situation is different. Um, your daughter. I see your daughter in a bar. She don't know me, but I know who she is. She's drinking. She's maybe 18, 19. She's a little bit out of order. Maybe some guy is slobbering all around her. I come over and you, get the fuck out of here. You know, well, I'm, get the fuck out of here. Go away. To the guy. And her, sweetheart, I'm going to make somebody take you home. You're a little drunk. Who are you? I'm my father's friend. Forget about who I am. Let's get out of the bar. And you, bartender, no more drinks for her. Stop. That's what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Because she's my niece. I value that. Now, your niece at 23 now, she's really sexy and beautiful. Maybe she's a turn on for me a little bit. I make that fucking blunder and look at her in that way, I could go and should go. So there's a lot of things. Then there's just, you know, street things that come up. But there's violations in, in the mafia that are death penalty. Now, we use each other like, we don't go looking for a guy and shooting him out. This isn't a gang. Mm -hmm. You're going to go, you broke the rules. I'm being given an order to whack you, take you out. Now, maybe Joe Blow is going to be the shooter. But me and you are friends. I'm going to be the guy to bring you into the speeding or wherever. You trust me. We're not cowboys. We're, we're going to make this hit real easy. You're going to come into this meeting with me, hey, bro, and Joe Bro's going to shoot you. Right, it's not a car bomb or you're not burning no. my house yeah, down. And, and that's another rule. Yeah. We're not supposed to use car bombs. Like they do that in Italy and other places. We're against that because you can kill innocent people. We're not into that. Um, we're worried about killing innocent people. We're worried about what we're supposed to be. Men of honor. That's not very honorable. If I kill you and I kill a woman and a child who got in the car with you or, or was by the fucking thing, no drive-by shootings. Shoot them in the motherfucking head. That's, who, that's your target, not some kid, not some woman. So there's rules of how we kill. And unfortunately, that order from the boss, and if you, you disrespect an order from the boss, you die. But you can't refuse an order at all because then you're just as guilty of breaking a rule and then somebody else just has to kill you too. And then that same person you were supposed to kill is dead anyway. Yeah. You so can't stop matter. the hit. You could you could go do a boss is telling me to kill you. I could talk to the boss and say, please, let me talk to you. 
There's a situation I grew up with him. What he did, I could talk to him, blah, 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 blah. And I could try to straighten this thing. Mm -hmm. If the boss tells me, Sammy, no good. Take him out. And use this guy or that guy. I don't care what you use. Get him out. Take him out. He could even tell me to get rid of the body. He could tell me a lot of things. Put him in a trunk, throw him in the street. Whatever the, the thing is. If I disobey his order, I go. And you're going anyway. Yeah, so it doesn't even, it's like, you might as well do it because if you like me, you can be like, all right, I'm going to make sure he's dead. I'm going to make sure he's not dr drowning in his lung fluid or I'm going to make it outside. fast yeah. for you. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. That's the way I can help you is make it super fucking fast. You won't even know what the fuck hit you. If I had to die tomorrow morning, I would choose that way, getting shot right in the fucking head. Mm -hmm. It's Especially with a, with a, a decent-sized caliber gun, you wouldn't even know what hit you. I've seen it many times. It, you wouldn't even know what it is. It's the fastest way to die, in my opinion. But uh, what really gets to me in this thing is that as much as I like you or love you, oh, you know the rules as well as I did. Look at what the fuck you did. I mean, you, you knew this. And I blame you because you knew I would probably be the schmuck that has to bring you mm -hmm. in. You felt like killing yourself. Why didn't you just go hang yourself some fucking way? You knew what this what, what this was going to bring. And, and that happens a lot. A guy would be sick. Oh, my God. How did he do this? He's doing it to himself. Right. That's how we look at it. You did this to yourself, bro. It's not I woke up this morning. I want to kill you. It's not that we don't kill for money. So it's not like I want to kill you and take over your business or take your money. Mm -hmm. If two fucks about your business or your money, you know, if we're friends, I'm, I hope you are rich and I hope you are powerful because you're probably, we're probably going to be helping each other that way. So, and that we do a lot. So there's no reason for the money or the greed. Some assholes will do that, but there's assholes in every fucking walk of life. Cops, politicians, there's all kinds of fucking assholes in all walks of life. And the mafia is not excluded from that either. But if a guy is, you know, you're doing this for money, either you're out of your mind, then, then there's a line with killing. Some people in our life, like Roy DeMeo and people like that, they cross the line to us. He became a serial killer. He's killing people, innocent people, for no fucking reason now. Or stupid reasons. And we killed him. To keep up... To to uh, show because that you became a serial killer, you don't deserve to fucking live, whether you're a made guy or not. We don't do things like that. You, uh, you, you. If you're a child molester and you're a made guy, you're gonna go if we find out. Mm -hmm. If you're a rapist, you should go. You're, there's things that were questionable, and guys got just put on the back, back burner. Not enough maybe to kill the guy, but put on the back burner. But if you're a full bone child molester or rapist mm -hmm. or a serial killer, we're going to kill you. That's not us. So whether you're in our life or out of our life, we will kill you. If you're part of coming in our neighborhood and you, you have those traits, we'll kill you because the neighborhood is our neighborhood, our people. We protect it. Did it bother you when you had to kill people or did you feel like stress or anxiety? Remorse? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, and I said this in my podcast, I said this many times, I think a piece of me died on every one of those murders. Almost every one of those murders. Some, some of them I didn't really care, I'll be honest. I'm not going to say that. But a good part of them, a piece of me died with every one of them. It's a scar in my body. I feel it. When I talk about it in my podcast, maybe I'm getting old. I actually become emotional with, with it. It almost brings me to tears. I, it's, it just rips at me. It's like I open up that scar when I start talking about it, and I and I become emotional, which I don't really want to. I'm not a person that normally cries, but it brings me close. Maybe it's the old age. I don't know what the fuck it is, but those scars are buried, and I I, I open them up when I talk about these things. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. I'm not gonna make you go through that. I was just wondering because some people will think, okay, well, you're a sociopath. You killed all these people, uh, and you don't even care. But it sounds like that's not the case. I, I know you think a lot, or you had to think a lot anyway, about planning a hit, how you're going to deal with it because it was your job for a long time. 
when you're planning someone's murder, you know, what are you taking into consideration? Is it like you got to have a way to get rid of the body, for example, but what else is there that the average person might not think of? Make sure they don't suffer, that kind of thing. Well, that's not my first thought, is not make them suffer, to be honest. A planning of a hit is that when I get a hit on someone, everything in my life stops. I get blind as art. The only thing on my mind and the only thing I could see is you. I now start researching in my own mind. What do you do every day? Where do you go every day? Who do you meet with? If you're married, do you have a girlfriend on a sneak? Do you uh, have a gym that you go to every day? Or all of these things. I'm, I'm researching for the place that I'm going to kill you. I get other guys in different positions. A crash car. Backup shooters. So you're going to come in here. You have that door to run out. You have that door to run out. There's going to be people there. You can't get out. I'm going to make sure you can't get out. I have a start button. No stop button until you're dead. I don't think about business. I don't think about money. I don't think about family. I don't think about getting laid. I don't think about nothing but you. The only thing that makes me stop thinking about you is when you're dead. The hit is over. And I go back about into my life. And it's hit is behind me. What's the timeline? Like if I'm if you get an assignment, is it like the guy's gone in three days, three weeks, three months, or it's flexible? I don't think there's any timeline. You gotta hit. You gotta take all the possibilities. Uh, I don't wanna hurt any legitimate people in the process of doing killing you. I uh, I mean if I'll give you an example. One guy, we were going to kill him. He was hard to get. And I made an appointment in a lawyer's office. I was going to meet him in the lawyer's office and uh, be in a conference room talking to him, just like I'm talking to you. Two, three guys would come in with ski masks, screaming to people, get down, get down. I'd get down, you'd get down. They'd blow your fucking head off and leave me. I could stay there. The cops would come. We, we were talking about business. Fuck away, no. People mm -hmm. came in with ski masks and they killed him. I don't know what happened. And that's what the people in the office would say. And we couldn't get him. So that's the only place we could have got him. So I was going to do it. And uh, I, make sure you don't hurt the, the woman in, at the front desk and don't hurt nobody, whatever. So then the guy came back. He says, he's going to come. There's one problem. Well, he's going to come with his daughter, who's a lawyer. So she's going to come with him to this meeting. Oh, yeah. Good. Canceled the whole thing. And I canceled it. So that's what I do as a hit guy. Because he didn't want to kill him not, in front of his daughter. That's I'm not going to kill him in front of his, her or in front of her. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I, that's off. So I will continue working on you in different ways. And that's what goes through the mind of a hit guy. Some jerk off, maybe he'll do it in front of the daughter. Maybe he'll shoot the daughter too. I don't know what he'll do. Yeah. But a, a true hit guy plans a hit, makes sure it works properly, and takes into consideration every option that could happen and how are you going to defend it. Cops come. There's a guy in the car with a licensed, legitimate car. You're going with your car. Cops are right behind you. As soon as he can, he crashes into the cop car. And you can go. A block car. Turn down a small block. That block car is waiting for him. He sees him. He sees the cops coming. He goes right behind him. Halfway down the block, he stops his car. He's having trouble with the car. The cops come out, get move that car, move that car. I can't move it. It's stopped. It's stuck. And he's got his license. He's a legitimate guy. There's different things a hit guy will do. It's not only to kill the person. It's how he can't get away. It's how you're going to block and protect the shooters, whoever the shooters are. 
So a lot of people say, you were part of that hit and you didn't pull the trigger. Of course I didn't pull the trigger. It doesn't matter who pulls the fucking trigger. Any moron could pull a trigger. But it's who plans the hit? Who makes the whole thing happen? Now, I might be the shooter. I might not be the shooter. In the Castellano hit, I wasn't the shooter. But I planned the whole thing. They came to me to plan the whole thing. It's like a military operation. Yes, CIA, military, I don't care what kind of, they, they have operations and they plan these things and do them. I would do that in my head in two seconds. Five. Just like I said, I'm talking to you. I'm pointing to that door. I'm pointing to that door. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm, I'm talking to you. Of course, I don't mean anything by it. But in my mind, I'm planning this hit. Right now, if I wanted to hit you, I could hit you. Zaza would come across with a shotgun. You're not even looking at her. She would shoot you. Mm -hmm. You don't expect it from her because she's a girl. I'm not, I, I don't use expect, she, I might expect it from her, but you're right. Your point is well taken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now this all makes sense. It's like a second nature. Is, is it something you still sort of think about? Not killing people, but is it still like a background operation in your head after all these years? Because it's, it's just a way of life for me. I get an apartment. When I get an apartment and where I'm going to live, I look at everything. I look at myself as the target, and I go outside and I look. Where would I take myself out from what I, in my mind, as being a hit guy? Yeah, I don't like that alley, or I don't like this. This should be lit, or this is where I'm going to be watching when I do walk out or get in or do this or that. I can't even get rid of that. That's in my head. Now, I do it subconsciously. Mainly, I don't purposely get up in the morning, hey, I'm going to look at this. It's subconsciously I do it. When I go into a restaurant, I where I sit subconsciously, I want to see what's coming in, what's happening. I don't sit with my back to a certain point. I immediately would tell my wife or oh, you, I'd like to turn around and could I sit there and do this? Did I juggle a little bit when we walked in? Uh, no, oh, for dinner the other night? <laughs> no, actually. I was wondering if you were going to, but we sat on the other... Wait, actually, I was sat on the other side, and you were like, oh, I'm going to sit in here. But some of that was a function of, of uh, our director not fitting into the table, no yes. names mentioned. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> some of that was <laughs> two logistics. Of them, two, of them. <laughs> two of them were big enough. Yeah. They couldn't but fit in. there's a little back room, if you took notice, in the back of that restaurant. Yeah, there was. That, and with a curtain over it, right? Mm -hmm. That's almost... A, I mean, it would be better to sit on that side to look at the front, right? Right. But I don't, I don't know who's behind that curtain. Right. So I'd rather sit where I was sitting because I could see that curtain. If somebody or something was coming in, now you got to come through 50 people. Right. You don't think they'd be screaming this, that, or whatever's fucking going on? Mm -hmm. I would know, see them where I was sitting. Normally, I'd sit there if there wasn't, uh, but that curtain, I'm not too crazy about that curtain. Yeah, there was a curtain there. That's interesting. I wondered if you were going to switch sides, and you did actually. Uh, yeah, that's funny. That's funny. We and talked about the seating, but yeah, we did. We, we were trapped into uh... that's right. Yeah, we had a different logistical situation. Yeah. Uh, so you got you got to make considerations for that. Yeah, for people. And once in a while, you got to drop the bob shit and sit where you got to sit. That's right. If it happens, it happens. Yeah, for people who are wondering what we're talking about, we sat with a couple of big guys that were the table was attached to the wall, and we had limited options of where we could sit. Yeah, I was talking with Sammy the Bull a couple months ago, and. He was saying it's it's horrible because you, you you have to kill everyone that you love because you're the one they pick to go after the, those people because they'll let you into the house when it's only them alone and then have a bunch of wine and let you stay really late until everyone goes to sleep like that's that's so they pick you for that and he's like it's awful of course for that reason well, that's how one of the kids in the bath uh, the guys on Bath Avenue in Brooklyn uh, he pushed uh, Anthony Spiro and then his own friends had to go there and kill him I mean. Uh, it's it's a lot harder when you know they're coming for you and then you're ready for it. It's almost like, you know how they tell you a woman who is more prone to be raped if she doesn't know how to defend herself. So you take precautions, you know, and you, you, some girls take martial arts or they try to carry mace with them and hold it in their hand, anything. And so make it more difficult for a criminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they know that you're not going to have any defenses up. Man, it's That's just such a crazy way to live. Yeah. Just such a crazy way well, to live. Well, look at the way I have to live. I'm always looking well, yeah. over my shoulder. I mean, where I'm living yeah. in the place I'm at now, I could pretty much 
see what's going on and who might stand out in the crowd, so to speak. I, I read, I read these, um, th this is from your documents as well. Like Lucchese family associate Bruno Facciola was <laughs> executed in August, 1990 with a dead. Did I mispronounce the name? Is that why you're laughing? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. What, how That's would he okay, say though. it? I'm trying to say, what was the name that you were saying? Facio Bruno Facciola or something okay. like that. Fa it's F-A-C-C-I-O-L-A. Okay. It, yes, it's pronounced differently, I think, but that's okay. It, I, I don't like know it, Italian. Though. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry Facciola. about it. I'm Italian. I don't really I mean, know so much myself. Fasciola, maybe, but that's definitely got to be wrong. Um, <laughs> executed in August 1990 with a dead canary stuffed in his mouth as a sign that he was an informer and a warning to other mobsters. So that would be on my mind like every day, you know, like in the car, like, all right. I'd be listening for canaries and like, you, you got a bird in here? What do you need that for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Usually the kid Aries probably dead before they got you, you know what that I mean? That makes but, sense. Yeah, otherwise flying around the car. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But yeah, they have their own little tricks to to show you, you know, who's doing this. Um, it was like when they killed Willie Boy Johnson. I don't know if you ever heard of him. No, no. Well, Willie Boy Johnson was very close to, I think he was a childhood friend of John Gotti's. And later on, he became uh, an, an informant. And he said to them, to the process, to the AUSA, the assistant U.S. attorney, that I'll give you information, John, but I'll never testify against them. Well, they want him to testify against them. And he said, no. Well, what did the what did the U.S. attorney did? They put it out that he was a snitch. Oh, man. Now, if you remember, Willie Boy Johnson was found and shot, I don't know how many multiple times. They killed him, of course. Yeah. Uh, but the, they added him as a snitch. They had him. They actually had him killed because he wouldn't cooperate with them anymore. Wow! And so the FBI a, you played the mob. Yeah, the FBI. So the FBI played him and then played the mob into killing him because to, basic. It's almost like the FBI is like another crime family at that point. Well, the FBI are a real crime family. They listen. It was almost like say I was a I informed on the mob, but now it's like I'm a FBI whistleblower. Because, you see, I did work for the mob and I did work for the FBI. And to be honest with you, I would rather have worked and stayed with the mafia because at least I would have been killed. I wouldn't have had everything taken away from me. My, my livelihood, my status in my community, family members don't talk to me. I always have to look over my shoulder for the rest of my life. You know, uh, maybe there's no real hit against me like Sammy the Bull like had people wanting to kill him. But if somebody wants to come out of the woodwork and say, hey, isn't that that Joe Barone? Wait, I saw him. And then they want to make a name for themselves. They'll just shoot me. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so not, yeah. You know, they, it, there's a certain level of betrayal that you don't go beyond. It's not like somebody like my girlfriend went around my best friend. OK, it hurts. But, you know, eventually one day I'll get over it. I can live with it. This here I have to live with for the rest of my entire life, you know? Yeah, no, it makes sense. I mean, look, it, it reminds me, the late night meetup that you mentioned earlier, it sounds like, uh, I assume you've seen Donnie Brasco, right? Where Al Pacino, he gets the call, at the, and he, his wife comes out of the shower and he goes, eh, I gotta go meet somebody, I gotta, gotta, gotta go see. Oh, so late? And he's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. You know, you're so beautiful, I'll see you later. And then he, after she goes back in the bathroom to dry her hair or whatever, he takes off his watch, he takes off his ring, he takes out his lighter, he takes out his wallet, and he puts it all in a drawer that he leaves open for her. And uh, and I'll, I'll, we'll add the scene in the show notes, because it's, it's like an iconic scene from the movie. And, and Donnie Brasco, who was, I think, played by Johnny Depp or whatever, right, in the movie, he was an informant for six years. You were an informant for 18 years, so you had three times more, uh, I, I don't know, informing than uh, Donnie Brasco. And and I'm, I think you did a lot more damage to the to La Cosa Nostra, to the mafia, than he did probably too. Pro probably to some degree, yes. Uh, you know, and don't forget too. I always kept a, a certain amount of distance. Look, I, the the FBI had actually given me permission to kill a wise guy. Really, I didn't even know yeah. they could do that. 